Hi, everyone. Um, I'm not Keith. I, I don't know if you're expecting to see Keith today, but uh, I'm Jeremy Baskin. Unfortunately, Keith couldn't make it today, so uh, I'm stepping in for him and covering a similar, similar topic. So uh, before you run away, for the next 14 minutes or so, um, we're going to cover some of the, you know, what are the drivers in the digital supply chain and what is the journey that we're going through at the moment. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm the uh, managing director of a company called New Ways. I've been doing it for about the last three and a half years, being in that position. But prior to that, uh, I was the vice president of the supply chain for Coca-Cola. Um, and then for the senior director for supply chain for EMEA, so looking after Europe, America, and Africa. And prior to that, my whole life was spent in Unilever uh, from a graduate, a number of roles. But my last role I spent uh, putting in place what they call the planning center of excellence. So demand planning, supply planning, and SNOP, designing the process, and then implementing it across 140 countries. So. Uh, took about five or six years to do that and was a, a, a good experience. Um, so what we're going to do today is just give you a little bit of an introduction. What is New Ways? Uh, talk about supply chains and how those are evolving, the evolutions of systems, some uh, deep neural networks, because this is the machine learning and, and how we, we, you know, we talk about AI, we talk about machine learning. We'll give you some real examples. We'll talk about uh, Internet of Things, and we'll also talk about AI, and then bring it to life with a, with a bit of a demo as well, because a lot of these is, you know, we talk theory, but it's always good to see it in action as well. Um, so New Ways is a, a company that activates new ways of workings. We are a, a, a system integrator, but also we bring capabilities to life. So from doing health checks, to improving methods, to putting in planning system and decision tools, but also capability and workouts. And one of our biggest functions that we do is this, what we call managed services, because what we found is that trying to take business people from not knowing what good looks like to being what good looks like is a very long journey. And there's a way to accelerate that by actually coming in and doing it for you for one or two cycles and then handing it back over to you as a business with an up and running way of working effectively. So that accelerates the learning curve. This is the way the operation works and this is how you implement it and it's much easier to sustain. Um, so we recognize that the world is changing, and when we start talking about the supply chain, we talk about the planning side, we talk about the sourcing side, we're talking about the making or, or the acquiring side, and also the deliver, the, the, the deliver piece. But what we're seeing is that, I think we've seen it today, and, and I'm sure you've experienced this over the years, that there's increased focus on customer centricity, uh, you know, if you go and look at history, it used to be quality was everything. And 20 years ago, it was all about quality. If you didn't have the right quality, you weren't in the game. And therefore, quality became a prerequisite. If you didn't have the quality, you weren't in the business. Then we move on to pricing. Uh, and then we moved on to uh, uh, service. If you haven't got your products available, if you haven't got them on shelf in the right place in the right time, you, you, you tend to lose out on the game. We now move to the next one because quality is a pre-qualifier, pricing is a pre-qualifier, service is a pre-qualifier. We're now talking about customization. So that's the next one that we, we, we're starting to get, and it's about how do we react to, to that customization. We're also seeing volatility. Every business I speak to is saying, well, we're selling 70 to 80% to, to on deal. We're starting to see those volatility grow in in terms of shorter product life cycles. Some of the life cycles we're starting to see are three months. Uh, others have obviously uh, longer ones, and you want it at lower cost. So there's a huge change that is, is, is brewing, and there's also the environmental and the safety regulations that are coming. You know, if we're starting to ship things too much and we've got a big CO2 footprint, people stop buying our product as well. So we, you know, there's a lot of things going on and a lot of challenges. 
So what are, what's required? We need quicker lead times, smaller batches. Uh, we set up, we need to set ourselves up for success. We need to change the methods and the way we're doing things. We need to have different capabilities in place. We're starting to see lots of things around, and, and we'll talk about this uh, later on, about uh, we, we used to look at sell out, sell in data, what we used to sell into them. It's now about the sell out data. So how do we respond to that? And what are the methods that we use to start looking at the, the, the sell out? And then also we need to improve utilization and availability. So it's a changing world that we we, 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 we up against. Um, so what does that mean for the, the supply chain? If we talk about the traditional supply chain, um, we talk about understanding what the demand is. So we understand what our baselines are, and those baselines might be what we call regular rate of sale. It might be statistical. We create ourselves a baseline. We understand what our events are. We overlay that with some market insights that then feeds into the customer and the consumer. Um, is that how you run your supply chains at the moment, or is there, do you do things differently from a demand side? No. Okay. From, a, from, from, from supplying, we're starting to see the same thing. You start off with, from your plans, you acquire your raw material, you'll get your uh, manufacturing from your factories, your manufacturing warehouses is where the product is then sent to. It's then sent to the retailer's warehouse. It then goes to the retail store and then goes to the customer. And we're seeing sometimes that there are huge spikes, sometimes up to 250% down in this, the demand side, and then we're sitting out of, out, out of stocks. And this traditionally we call uh, uh, is, is taking between 10 to 18 days. And I know some of them are even taking longer, up to 45 days. But that's a long process from the planning process, from, make, from acquiring the raw materials and getting it away all the cross to your, to, to your customers. Um, and we use the technology of ATP, available to promise. When somebody places an order, do we have the stock? Yes, we do. We can promise it to the, to, to, to the customer. So that's what we call the traditional supply chain, and we see this in the majority of, of, of places. We then start seeing us involving a little bit more. We've now said, well, we need to be more responsive. So we're seeing, starting to see what we call a demand-driven. So instead of trying to do these baselines, we're trying to be more predictive about what's likely to happen. We're still feeding in our events if we know we're having promotions. But what we're starting to see is we're not using market, uh, market insights anymore. We're starting to use more live data. So what is that live data? That live data is stock and trade. Because if we know we've got a high level of stock and trade, that means actually we're not going to sell what we say we're going to sell. Um, we, we also getting a lot of what the, the EPOS data as well. So how do we bring that in and, 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 and build that into our supply chains? feeding back into the customer and the consumer. One of the biggest problems with this is I was involved with quite a big project uh, to, to, to bring in EPOS data and live data and use predictives. And we could say, right, we can, we can understand what has been sold for the last 24 hours. We know what stock we have. Therefore, we know what to produce tomorrow. The problem being is we couldn't produce tomorrow because your factories have a three months lead time on raw materials. We lock our plans four weeks out. So how do we create that response to, to that? Therefore, we need to think about how do we change our, our flow of, of goods, getting those flow of goods down to what we say four to eight days from this 10 to 18 days that we need to do. This takes different methodology, different thinking, and a different approach to, 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 to doing what we're doing. But also, it takes a different way that we actually have to respond. All of a sudden, we start talking about ATC. We no longer talk about available to promise, because when you receive an order in this type of environment, you actually don't have anything to promise, because you haven't made the stuff. You're going to make the stuff against what you've sold. 
So we call this available to commit. Because you know you've got the order, you know you're making it in the next four or five hours, and therefore you can commit to those orders. How do we get that back into our business? How do we set up our systems to go from available to promise to available to commit? I don't know if anyone's used available to commit principles. No, okay. But this is what we're starting to see happening in the industry. It's, start, it, it, it's very new. I mean, not very new. It's been around for a while, but only small, a few and fewer uh, businesses are adopting it. But this is what we're starting to see happening in the future is you need to be in a position to be committing rather than actually having physical, physical, physical stock in your hands. Um, but it then moves on to the next era, which we talk about the digital supply chain. Because what we're starting to see now is we're starting to use AI. I'm sure you've all heard about AI. I'm not quite sure what it is, but we'll talk about it later on. But it's, it's, it's using uh, artificial intelligence to try and understand. We're starting to get signs of early data now, early data from Google search. A company that I'm working with or have worked with is, is uh, in the pharmaceutical sector. What they're doing is they're using Google search for outbreaks of hay fever because they know if there's instances in a certain area, they will consume on average 16 weeks of stock in four days in that particular area. But what will happen is people will go into the pharmacy. When they go into the pharmacy, they're only holding four or five days worth of stock. So you would sell out very quickly. When you start seeing these hits in a particular area, you can dynamically allocate stock there and start sending it in. So when people do come through the door, you're starting to pick, pick that up already. We spoke about the live data, the customer, and also the, the, the consumer. But again, we now have a different, different uh, uh, model. We talk about this being agility because no longer is, that shouldn't be days, um, no longer are people wanting um, product in a couple of days. We're starting to talk hours now, half an hour. Sometimes you can order from Amazon and get delivered in the next half an hour or the next hour. So this whole model is changing to try and predict things before they actually even happen. The other thing we're doing with early data is, is trying to predict before we even sell it or before even somebody search for it, we're trying to predict trends. So if you give you some examples around that, we're starting to do trials now with RFID tags in books in WH Smith. Because what's happening in those books are how many times is a book taken off a, off a shelf and how many times has it been sold? So if you start realizing every time it's taken off the shelf, it's sold, you know that you need to replenish, you, need, need, you know you need to print more. Or if a book's been taken off the shelf and put back on the shelf 10 times and it hasn't sold any times, stop making it. Don't bring it back. So those are the insights that we're starting to use in these type of, 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 of areas. Um, so we then get on to what we call the system landscape, because in order to, to, to respond to this, it's, it's fine saying, okay, this is where the world's going, but what are our systems and our systems architecture that we have to, to, to support this? We all have ERP systems here, I hope. Everyone got an ERP system? Okay, good. What do we use our ERP system for? Financials and auditing. Do we use it for planning? No. Okay. Good. <laughs> what we're finding is those who use ERP systems for planning generally is done in Excel because it doesn't give you the functionality that you require. And my, always my question in a business is, how many workarounds do you have? Because that gives you an indication of the adoption of, 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 of your system. So the next phase is to then move on to say, well, we need some technology. And that technology is what we call the best of breeds, and you start to bring in various technologies to do certain things. So your CRM technology for your customers, your TPM for your trade promotions management, you bring that in. APS, your advanced planning and scheduling technology to do your planning and to doing your scheduling. Your MES, your manufacturing execution systems to drive your manufacturing on your, on, on your shop floor. 
And then also you want big data as well. So you bring in some technology to take all that data and give you some type of, 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 of reporting. So what we're starting to see is there's, there's a lot of best of breeds that are starting to, 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 to happen and uh, provide that uh, infrastructure. But that's not good enough because we now need to start automating things. We've heard about uh, RPA, Robotic Process Automation. To give you an example about robotic process automation, uh, in the UK, a, um, a fashion retailer has 750 stores. Each store has 20,000 stock keeping units. Every store has a different footprint. You sell three times more size 18s in the north than you sell down in the south. You sell three times more size 8s in the south than you sell in the north. You sell different, depend if it's an affluent area or non-affluent area, the rain changes. Those 20,000 SKUs in those 750 stores need to be replenished every single day from a central warehouse. And generally, you get it more wrong than right. But using automation, we found that you can write a footprint for each one of those stores based on a set of rules. And against those set of rules, what you do is you have a replenishment tactic. So no one no longer needs to go and work out what you've sold. It looks at what was went through the checkout. It looks at what the requirements are against the rules. It automatically sends the signal to your distribution center to pick, pack, and send within a tolerance. So if you're saying that the maximum tolerance is 10 and it decides that it wants 12, or it sends a text to the replenishment planner to say yes, no, or adjust, four hours to respond. If they don't respond, it gets uh, escalated to the, the, the next level up, and there's a full visibility of where the bottlenecks are. So those are the type of things we're starting to see robotic process automation come, in, come into play. Um, but then we start thinking about what's next, AI, artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is it's about rules. It's about following rules. We'll talk about how that works in, 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 in uh, the planning environment. But one of the examples where we see that happening in a separate, a separate environment is, for instance, is the medical, in the medical area. On average, there's about 130 medical journals that comes out every week. No doctor, no GP can keep up with, well, I don't think they can keep up with 130 30 medical, medical journals. So what they've done, they've did a trial in France where they captured all the medical journals into, into AI. They then every week update it, and they use that for the GP to help them with their diagnostics. So w diagnosis. When a per patient goes in and sees a GP, what they do is they type in their symptoms, and it will send out against this, these are the five or six possible ones, and therefore the GP's role is to try and work out which one of those six, because generally they've only thought of two, they didn't realize the others. And they've seen the, the, the rate increase of diagnostics from 60 to 70 to percent into the 90s just using, using uh, some of these tools. So it's there to support and, 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 and aid us. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. No, okay. So yeah, just coming back into the planning world and the supply chain, we talk about advanced planning and scheduling, and this is where we start understanding where we have maturity against the advanced planning and scheduling system. So we say, we start off doing things manually, spreadsheets, Excel. We then start emerging where we have things like basic stats, we have master planning schedule, we have MRP, materials requirements planning, and this is what we start seeing that ERPs are able to handle. They quickly run out of steam when they're starting to do what we call the intermediate, which is starting to bring in multiple customers, starting to bring in multiple locations, starting to do dynamic uh, MPSs. It starts to run out of steam, and this is where you start bringing in your best of breeds. And then you want to go to advanced, which is starting to do things like AI, scenarios, and automation that comes along with that. Um, so that's the history of tools. The other one is, um, this is what we talk about, this artificial intelligence. And one way to explain it is setting, it sets itself a set of rules. So they call this deep neural networks. And those neural networks are basically, 
yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. These are the binary ones that are trying to connect dots to each other. And the more dots that you're able to connect, the quicker you're able to do things. And when you're programming things, this is what you effectively do, is you're connecting these dots together, and then through that machine learning, following those rules, the machine is actually able to adapt them. It doesn't create any new rules, it follows rules. The problem we have in life is when the machine starts creating its own rules, that's when we're in trouble, okay? So we give it rules, it follows rules, and it works its way by following those rules. So that all sounds a bit bizarre to me. I hope it sounds bizarre to you. So what I've got is a little video here. Oh, dear, what have we got? Uh, why have I got that? So this is an example here where we set a set of rules to play an Atari breakout game. They spent, I think it was 10 minutes, training the machine through using those neurons. These are the things that you follow to follow a set of rules to try and play a game of Atari. And this is what it was able to do in 10 minutes by, by setting up those rules and following those rules. It wasn't that good, but I suppose it's better than I am. Uh, so then they went off and they spent 120 minutes training it. And within 120 minutes, it started to play like an expert, following those neural rules that they had put in place. So this is the machine now playing this game. Then they spent another 240 minutes training it. And what had worked out, that if it hits the product on the side, on the tunnel, it would then clear everything. So through those rules, it actually worked out how to play that more effect effectively. So that's the way that we sort of bring it to life, setting those rules and creating those boundaries, and then it, each time it does it, it learns more and more and more on how to, on how to deal with it. Okay. So we, we, we're talking about Internet of Things. We talk about devices out there. Um, what we're starting to see happening as well is the old way of doing a stock take in a warehouse was we would go and count everything, or we would do a cycle count, or we would count it once a month via various different cycles. And at the end of the year, we would find we have a discrepancy. So the auditors would come in, and they would spend four days counting it. And we found that the accuracy was around about 98% of doing it. New technology is starting to see things like RFIDs. So we're starting to put RFID tags on a number of items. So all you do is you walk through with your scanner. You walk just straight through your warehouse, and it's done your stock take with 99.5% accuracy. So those are the type of things that we're starting to see happen. And this is how we're starting to be able to track things throughout. This is just a, one example of an internet of things and a sensor. They reckon by 2020, which is now, there's 50 billion devices out there that can either read or write or send you a, a, a signal. If you look at cars, how many devices there are. If you look at all the sensors out there. So there's so much information out there to, 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 to use. The other, the other one is they're using is the, we talked about these smart shelves where they're, they're doing the books to understand some of the behaviors, but the other places they're starting to try and understand the behaviors using various tags and various sensors is in the clothing and apparel. So Zara, you all know the clothing company Zara, they, all their clothes have RFID tags in them. So they know exactly where they are, where they're sitting, how many have gone through the checkout. But they've taken to another level. They've now put RFID readers going into the change rooms. 
So they know how many times a garment has been tried on and how many times the garment has been sold, whether they need to make more or they need to make less. So those are giving them the signals that come through. In jewelry shops now, they're starting to put, put the sensors on them because it tells them how many times a piece of jewelry has been taken out and put onto the counter. So again, it starts telling them if a piece of jewelry has been put on the counter 10 times and it hasn't sold, is it a price, is it a design issue? It helps them starting to make those decisions using, using the, the, the technology around them. Um, and it's about how we connect that up. You know, you've got devices, there's gateways, there's automation, there's big data, and there's various other items. It's about how we take these 50 billion, uh, we connect them, and we use them is one of the keys that uh, I think are our next challenge that we're looking at. We're also finding that to implement solutions are taking us on average 12 weeks to do these days because things have become so much easier and so much simpler that it's taking on average uh, 12 weeks to implement. This is just an example that I, 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 I pulled out. This is a Gartner report showing, showing you where businesses are spending their money at the moment. So what we've seen is it used to be a cost-driven management business. It was, used to be about driving production and efficiency. When you start looking at the budgets of big businesses at the moment, you can see cost management and efficiency it has the least amount. Their focus is more about growth, structure, <laughs> development, and uh, IT-related and workforce, making sure people have the right capability. So we're seeing a significant shift in businesses' priorities and significant shift in the spending base that is, that, that is going on, where what we used to spend money on versus what we're spending on at the moment. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about predictive sensing and um, starting to get towards what we call AI. We first of all start off with local sensing. That's what we're talking about. These 50, with, with these 50 billion sensors are out there. That's where we are. We've got lots of sensors. We're now starting to go through data integration, so we're starting to integrate these centers into our database, and I think that's where the majority of businesses are focusing on, or the majority of technology are focusing on. We're starting to do a little bit of analytics of these things, but we're finding it's still difficult because we haven't got this data integration right, and then we're using the cognitive actions, the machine learning, the, the head thinking. Um, you know, some of the Google trends that are going out, the amount of information that is out there, you can see how many times a very simple report that's out there that you can load directly into your system on a daily basis, you can see how many times uh, uh, people have searched for a product or your logo or your company, and therefore you can start making decisions about that. Um, and then also there's the cognitive actions and the predictive analytics that uh, uh, go along with it. So we move on to artificial intelligence. What does artificial intelligence mean? It's a system that can perform cognitive function normally performed by humans. So that's what we talk about. A system that can take action without instructions from a human a system that can learn, as we saw early on, you can set it some rules and against those rules, against those criteria, it can start learning. And whatever is new in computer science. <laughs> but effectively, and the best marketing breakthrough since bar one get one three offer. So what, what is AI in the supply chain planning? What do we see? It's an algorithm that we use for statistical models, software techniques that automate subjects, and it's used for decision making, is one of our, 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 our key one. But also, it can be stochastic decision making. Um, so there's primarily two applications in supply chain that we see currently. One is to improve the way that we forecast accuracy and the other ones to automate routines or planning decisions. 
So the example that I gave you around the, um, the RPA is one of the areas where we're starting to see automating, making decisions, how much must I replenish against what I was sold following, following those particular rules. Okay. So this just gives you an example of, of what we call lights out planning because ideally we want to get to a stage that all the mundane things that are currently happening, we don't need to focus on anymore. We know we have the ERP, the transaction system of record, that's what you have the ERP system, but against your supply plan or your supply chain, you start to see all the different elements that start coming through. So statistical modeling, multi echelon inventory, capacity opera optimizations, MRP capacity optimization, again for, for part production schedule, inventory optimization, and purchase orders. So those are the things at the moment we talk about supply chain planning, those are the things we're focusing on, and those are the areas where we're starting to use uh, what we call, we, we, we call AI. Um, this is an example from Vanguard. So Vanguard is one of our, our partners that we use uh, their uh, solutions, their solution software from. And what we find is that there are three different types of machine learning. There's the statistical other algorithms, which can find patterns and relationships that, 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 that exist. There's knowledge-based. So this is where you have the coded, co coded rules and can solve complex problems, like inventory stocking, and then the persistent knowledge that stores and repeats the decision. And from that, it can do comparisons against ver various elements. So we're starting to see different levels of AI used for different, uh, 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 different, uh, different applications. And this just gives you an idea from, you know, we talk about we have the data, but against that we have wisdom, knowledge, and information, which drives the persistent knowledge, the knowledge-based systems, and the machine learning. And just putting that in, in, in context, we talk about work and we talk about time. We, we automate processes. That's, you know, there's quite a lot of work and the time it takes. But when we start using machine learning, that brings that down. When we start bringing knowledge-based system, it even brings the, the, the work and the time down even more and, and, and persistent knowledge even, even further. So these are the different techniques and the differences that we see between them. Um, right. So I think what we've done is we've talked enough about all these concepts. I don't know if there's any questions. No? All right. So what I thought we would do is just, just show you some of the... Um, Bring, bring this to life. So this here is a, um, a Vanguard system. This is your, when you go into the system, you see a general uh, a dashboard. Against that dashboard, you will have various things like workflow, so you can follow things. So now you come a structured, structured way of saying, this is the work that needs to be done. And against the work that needs to be done, you can see who's completed their task and then fall drilled down. So in the past, demand planning or supply planning used to be a black art. Are you doing a good job, demand planner? Yes, I am. How do I know I'm doing a good job? Well, we're not quite sure. Um, this is a structured process saying, these are the files you need to go to. This is what you need to open. So for instance, if you go into demand planning, and you want to see, well, these reviewing these exceptions, why is it only 55% complete? And you can see who, who's completed it and who hasn't completed it, so you can take the necessary action. But this is the, the way that we start to structure things. Um, when we talk about AI, I'm going to go into a forecast record. Uh, So the hardware, we, this is a auxiliary hardware service and software we sell. These are SKUs, and let's go look at the SKU for EMEA because we in EMEA. So this will show you here your, um, your sales, your, your forecast, your, your actuals, and then it will show you here what is your confidence level. 
as you can see, that's a confidence level. So this confidence level is based on using various different methods. So this method here is called an AI selection. Before I go into that, I want to just open up this pane here. And this shows you, this shows you here your error, so you can start seeing these curves if you're a, a, a statistical forecaster and you want to see your bell curve and the probability, you can see these factors. And to understand what it's used, we go into the method. Uh, I need to get on here. So when you start doing statistical methods, here this is an example of, say, 51 different statistical forecasting curves. So against these different statistical curves, you can select them manually. If you select them manually, it will just go back and recalculate your error, and you can see your confidence level gets worse on that particular one. But again, rather than you spending the time and trying to work out what is likely, what are you predicting to happen, you press the AI selection, and the AI selection will then run through all those models. Against those models, it will look at the pre pre predictability against those models, and it will come back with uh, it's come back with a, uh, a seasonal vanguard dampened trend, and there you can see your, your error of predictability. So this is just an example of how we're starting to use uh, AI effectively uh, to work out what that level is being, rather than somebody going through all those, those, those particular methods or manually calculating it. So therefore, the demand planner can focus on, on, on more value added. That's just an example of AI. The next example is automation. So against that, um, against that probability, what it will do, it will automatically work out what inventory you need to do. So that's your inventory drop, and this is your reorder point or your production point. And against that, it will tell you when you need to order, and it will also tell you your open schedule. But how's that been automated? You can set various rules. That's been calculated at an eco economic order quantity. But saying, well, I don't want to do an economic order quantity. There's various rules that you can set, or you can actually make them up yourself. Say, I want to do at a full rate of 95%. So all of a sudden, it works out to have a full rate of 95%. It's now rescheduled the whole way that you need to be, be doing your order point or your production point. It's automating it against, uh, against that particular area. Or if you say, I want to have 30 days cover, it will automatically calc that to say that is what it needs to be, and then send off your signals to your order points of uh, when you need to reorder, when you need to reproduce, uh, re, 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 remanufacture, etc. So that's just an example of automation, how it can help you improve your life, also from, from an AI pers pers perspective. So that was a quick summary. Uh, of of supply chain. I hope that was useful. Um, I don't know if you have any questions.